Tonight our first author is going to be Chelsea Pitcher. Chelsea Pitcher is a karaoke singing, ocean worshipping Oregonian with a penchant for rescuing animals and humans. She began writing at a very young age. By age 10, she created a newspaper titled The Daily Ferret in an ill-conceived attempt to gain a pet ferret from her parents. There's definitely a story behind her. <laughs> she was unsuccessful. Still, years later, success would find her when, she, uh, when her short story, The Raven and the Razor, was accepted into author Francesca Lea Block's Love, Magic, and Anthology. Soon after, she began exploring themes of bullying, suicide, and survival in her debut uh, novel, The S Word, which was published by Simon & Schuster in 2013. Everybody, Chelsea Pitcher. Of 
party time. Okay, that's what I would be saying if I could go back in time. If I could just return to the beginning of spring, I would be fun loving Angie to join with Drake at the hip and up for a grand old time. Preparing for a bash after Lizzie's death is a bit like entering an alternate dimension. The motions are all the same, they feel different. You look different, my mother says, as I examine my reflection in the glass of the front door. It's 8.35, Jesse is late. I shiver before I realize mom's talking about my outfit. She's not so good at the whole mind reading thing. I look sexy, I say, don't you think? I'm wearing this skin tight suit over a satin corset that pushes my boobs up to my chin. Everything black. I look dangerous and feminine and masculine at the same time. Jesse better love it. Mother doesn't. I think you need some color, says the collector of the cement gray pantsuit. I want to compliment my date. No shit, she says. I follow her gaze through the glass. There's Jesse skipping up the walkway, his raspberry fruit fruit skirt over dark pants. He's going to outdress me at every turn, I say. This could be a problem. Mom can't read sarcasm. <clears throat> Do we need to have a talk about how happy you are that I've made a friend? Angelina, she says. Yes, he's gay, mother, so you don't have to worry about me sleeping with him. She frowns into her Syrah. Your father did talk to you about sex. <clears throat> he did, she insists to herself. Oh my god, this is not happening. Um, I'm 17 years old, I say. Answer the question. Yes, he did. Totally. Is she kidding? Honey, she says. Pills, bitchiness, bloating, no baby. I can see Jesse poised to ring the bell. You done here? She kisses my forehead rigidly. Have fun, sweetie. I'm out the door faster than she can say condom. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, they travel to the party. I'm not going to read that part. I'm going to get you right back into the action. Um, so, they are waiting for their classmate Kennedy to arrive, who's the person that Angie wants to interrogate. And the idea is that Jesse's going to get Kennedy to go upstairs into a bedroom where he can ask her questions and she'll think that they're alone. Secretly, my protagonist wants to be hiding in the closet with me. Um, but as she soon finds out, playing detective in real life is a little bit more complicated than playing detective on TV. Kennedy doesn't show until well after 10.30, and by then, Jesse's already drunk. I don't think he usually drinks. We're back in the living room, and he's bopping around to the dumbest song in the universe, while I'm trying to calculate the likelihood of Captain Morgan blowing our cover. <laughs> Meanwhile, Kennedy's on the other side of the room, watching some guy do a beer bomb. She hasn't even looked in our direction. Then out of nowhere, Jesse goes all gentleman on me and offers to get him another drink. My no thanks is halfway out of my lips when I realize he's giving me a sign. I swallow my, my words and nod, not trusting my voice. I'm nervous, okay? I can admit it. Kennedy squeals when she sees him, and they do that Parisian air kiss thing. Then she gives him this hug like she's never been happy to see anybody in her life. She holds on way longer than necessary, which means she's either really lonely or really drunk. And she never goes anywhere without a slew of copycat cheerleaders and a bunch of drooling douchebags. I'm guessing it's the booze. She probably took shots when we drive over. For the first time, I wonder if she has some kind of death wish. Not all attempts at suicide are as obvious as listens. Jesse steers Kennedy to a painting above the mantel, and I bolt up the stairs, opening the first door I see. I'm hoping for Kara's bedroom. Wrong. Try again. The master bedroom sprawls out before me, all pomp and frills. These people actually have black satin sheets. I'm turning around to leave when the absolute last person I want to see steps into the room. He checks the lock on the door before he sees me. Got big plans, I ask? Drake, aka my ex-boyfriend, practically jumps out of his skin. Angie! He wipes his forehead like it's sweaty. Hey! I didn't know you were here. <laughs> I imagine it's difficult with me standing right in front of you. Why are you being so hard on him, I think? 
He's human, like Liz is human. But he made a mistake. So it bugs me when he doesn't look wounded. Actually, he kind of laughs. Hey, can I talk to you somewhere, he says. Somewhere else? He glances at the door. Yeah, don't you think? What? I mean, Kara will probably be pissed that we're in here. You're right, I say. I want to talk to you, too. Meet me in my car in two minutes? Your car? We can just go down, please. I place my hand on his chest, over his heart. OK. He opens the door a crack and peers down the hall. OK, good, let's do that. Cool, I push past him. I just have to pee. Drake grabs my arm. I can see Jesse at the bottom of the stairs, trying to pull Kennedy away from these brothers who've been fighting over her all year. I wave to him, but he doesn't see me. That one's full, Drake nods to the bathroom. I think someone's sick in there. I'll wait, I say. I'm giving him a nudge toward the stairs when the bathroom door opens. Out comes Kara herself, wiping vomit from her mouth. Hey, baby! She slumps against Drake. Her dark hair spills over his shoulder. I got that. Oh, Angie! She shrieks, just noticing me. I'm so glad you came. Pushing up Drake's chest, she curls herself at me, her arms draped sloppily around my neck. Kennedy and Jesse are climbing the stairs. Drake's standing, stunned between us, and I'm stumbling under the weight of a drunken hug attack. Could things possibly get worse? Come on, universe. I dare you. <laughs> I actually yes. do. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, because I I, uh, I do talk to my kids a lot about the idea of writing about what you know. And can you go into that a little bit about how you focus on this particular um, idea of where you're right, where you're writing with about what you know, about what you've seen, what you've studied. Yeah. Um, it's. I mean, this is definitely fiction. It's not. Um, specifically something that happened to me, but there are a lot of pieces in there that um, have come out of my own life. I, um, I befriended a person around the time that I was, right before I started writing this, whose best friend had committed suicide. Um, and he talked to me about it a lot. And the thing that struck me was, even though he had done absolutely nothing wrong, he hadn't been mean to this person, he hadn't caused their death in any way, he completely took on the blame for it, which I think is really normal in those situations, because everybody wants to know, what could I have done? Did I do something wrong? Um, even if they were a great friend of that person. So I definitely used, um, drew on that in the story, and I thought about how you would feel if you had done something that wasn't nice to that person. Um, that really inspired Angie's level of guilt in the story and why she feels so compelled to understand everything that happened and make it right as much as she can. Obviously, she can't make it right completely. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Should we hear some of these other fabulous authors? Well, thank you so much for having me. This is such a great... <laughs>